Hi, my name is Ilmari Lohkangas and uh, as of September I'm working for TDF as a development marketing person. I've been recruiting people to free and open source projects for several years and I find it to be quite challenging. Today I'm going to talk about a very specific way to recruit contributors. So TDF has been using a volunteer recruiting platform called Volunteer Match since April 2018. Before I tell you about our experiences with it, I will make clear the benefits. So we've been able to reach people outside our usual sphere of potential contributors and we have been forced to look at our technical documentation uh, critically and to refine it. And also having a presence on volunteer match increases awareness of LibreOffice and the structure of our contributor community. Well, and then comes the shocking fact. We get uh, contacts dropping out without doing any work. So after this dose of positive thinking, we can face the harsh reality. It has been an enormous challenge to figure out how to approach this source of volunteers. If we look at the statistics, we see a rather curious pattern. The stats show uh, 38 contacts for C++, 89 for quality assurance, 33 for user experience design, and 8 for documentation. We also have opportunities for visual design and marketing, but there was no point in including them because visual design only received two contacts and marketing has never received contacts at all. So only five persons in quality assurance and one person in documentation did any actual work. So we get plenty of contacts but very few of them move to contribute. When responding to the contacts in the beginning, I was inevitably fumbling in the dark as I was lacking the experience. The experience and understanding built up quite slowly as I could not really draw conclusions on anything after several months. After witnessing contact after contact drift away without ever starting to contribute, it became apparent that this platform was not some magical funnel of contributors. We would have to deal with this as a problem to solve rather than as a turnkey solution. The burning question is, what happens between the act of contacting us and the non-act of never doing any work? The frustrating lack of data from this area meant that we had to operate on theoretical assumptions when trying to improve our approach. Let's consider the background of the contacts for a moment. Most of the people have never used LibreOffice. The ones that have heard of it are a minority. Not everyone mentions their uh, education and work background. There are many professionals and some students. This is different from the usual crowd of contributors. Personally, I had no experience in quality assurance before I started bringing LibreOffice bug reports. So non-professional LibreOffice enthusiasts have the advantage of being familiar with the software and having a strong drive to improve it. On the other hand, professionals are expected to be able to understand any software from the perspective of their expertise. Professionals have the advantage of knowing the tools of their trade and should thus learn our workflows much faster than amateurs. Here is a screenshot of our C++ development opportunity as it appears on the Volunteer Match website. 
In principle, anyone browsing our posted opportunities could start to contribute without sending us a message through volunteer match. The opportunity descriptions include the necessary information and links to technical documentation. In practice, there have been maybe one or two cases where someone appeared in the chat without reaching out to volunteer match. Uh, here is how I responded to people inquiring about bug testing in the very beginning. So I said, uh, I'm happy to hear from you. Have you already created an account at our Baxilla? At the link. Do you have experience in quality assurance? If you want, we can chat in real time and then the chat information. Uh, I typically reply to the contact emails on the same day as I receive them, but I think it's pretty important to be quick in this. So here is an evolution of the previous email after some months of tweeting. So it goes like this. Triaging, analyzing newly arrived bug reports is by far the most time-consuming activity for us. We get anywhere from 600 to 800 reports per month, here is our guide for getting started with triaging. It has a quick start guide I made that is a good fit for beginners. After you have tested a bunch of bugs according to the beginner instructions, you might start studying the more complete guide to triaging. And then mention about the communication opportunity. Some people did schedule a chat or even a voice call with me. During this period, some designer contacts even joined a design team meeting. It was emotionally taxing to first get excited about the idea of what seemed to be a game-changing increase in contributors and then realize it was just an illusion. And here is the current incarnation of my response to basically any inquiries. inquiries. Uh, this is the beginning of the email. So it goes, our docs are pretty good and the work can be self-starting, but I would still like to interview you. We can talk in text mode over IRC. When would be a good time for you? I am in Helsinki, Finland and available during blah blah blah. Uh, please use this time zone converter to find the most convenient time for you and me. So the background for this is one day in September last year, I was discussing the frustrations related to the situation uh, with longtime contributor Drew Jensen. And the interaction with Drew was really beneficial as it gave me the idea for a better structured approach. I decided that instead of being optional, orienting interviews would be required. If a person never replied to my request for an interview, I would not need to speculate, is there something wrong with the information I provided? At first, I offered IRC chat or Jitsi audio calls as the platform for the interview. Over time, it became apparent that people really preferred text chat over audio calls, so I could simply stop mentioning Jitsi. As most of the contacts, live in the United States, and I live in Finland, scheduling the interviews became interesting. I settled on mentioning my available local time and uh, referring to an online time zone converter. So, the interviewing is a good method to fill gaps in understanding basic concepts uh, and they get used to a crucial tool that we use, the chat and I'm able to make sure they know what to expect of the work and I can of course convince them that it's a great idea to work with us it should be obvious that tech documentation cannot replace human interaction meeting on location would be optimal but remote mentoring is the only sustainable solution because we cannot have a thousand mentors on standby 
spread across the major cities of the world. So typically, the interview goes like this. Uh, I tell them they can learn a lot and getting guidance from our skilled experts. Uh, I tell them about our user base, the contributor community, and the events. Uh, and I tell them they can contact me directly via email or chat to ask for assistance or ask in public in the chat. And some questions they might ask me is how many hours we expect them to work per week? and if they can get a recommendation letter. So I just say the hours are entirely up to them and I promise to sign a recommendation letter but so far no letters have been signed. After starting the mandatory interviews about 50% of the contacts have agreed to be interviewed. So that's kind of a big filter effect there. So, it's very rare to get an explanation on why someone did not start working. And here are a couple. So, a quality assurance reply after an interview. I don't think this will work. I thought I had the time, and I don't. And uh, a design person replied, and never interviewing. After reviewing all the info you provided, I do not think I am the right fit for this position. So I think the first reason is much more common than would appear. It might explain much of what we see here with the amount of contacts. Because people are hopeful about their <laughs> amount of free time. And for the second one, I would have loved to get more details, but unfortunately, did not receive anything more. So while preparing this presentation, I ran into an article on the Volunteer Match website that reveals our experience is actually quite normal. This is a bit of a relief, as it confirms the optimizing strategy has been the right approach. So they say, we have found that many volunteers who use our service make connections with multiple opportunities and organizations. So they like going shopping for what's the best uh, organization. And on average, 25% of connections result in successful ongoing volunteer relationships. So what did we get out of this? Uh, one documentation contributor reviewed two chapters of Getting Started Guide and three quality assurance contributors did meaningful work checking 30, 80 and 420 reports. So one of the quality assurance contributors has done significant work and wants to get into automation next. <coughs> And some random interesting things. We got two inquiries from students who were in the USA on an F1 visa. They had completed their studies and needed to find some work, even volunteer work, to continue their stay in the country. Or they would be kicked out. This happens in the context of a thing called optional practical training. Unfortunately, TDF does not have a branch office in the United States, so we were not able to help them. Well, I did try to help them anyway. So, Volunteer Match is not the only game in town. There are other platforms, many of which do not operate internationally. And uh, recently, Zdenek Srenonek has added LibreOffice to a Czech volunteer platform called Umsem Umtam. I look forward to working with Zelenyek and helping with this effort. As recruiting continues to be such a challenge, I have started wishing we had science to guide us. It turns out 
there is a genre of scientific literature about contributors in free and open source software and how to recruit them. The researchers are doing helpful stuff and I hope uh, to somehow work with them in the future. One such researcher is Anne Barco, who is pursuing a PhD at LERA, the Irish Software Research Centre at the University of Limerick. This year she released a paper called Why do episodic volunteers stay in free and libre open source communities? It is based on a survey to test a proposed model of factors associated with keeping contributors in free software projects. So even though the paper was specifically about irregular contributors, I found it useful that it considered different motivations in a fine-grained way. The paper concludes that social norms, satisfaction and community commitment are all positively associated with an intention to remain. In the results of this particular survey, contributor benefits were not related with intention to remain. So what, what are these contributor benefit motives? Uh, they included, I want to be recognized for my contributions, I want to receive a tangible acknowledgement of my contributions, I volunteer to get a reputation in the free software scene. I volunteer to improve my job opportunities, to make money, to learn and develop new skills. Uh, based on what I have observed, it would appear that among the people coming to volunteer match, contributor benefit motives are more strongly represented. In an email conversation, uh, Barcom said benefit motives might have more of an impact in recruitment as opposed to retention. Thanks. <laughs>